Anybody check the score yet? Anybody? 11 to 7 still? Yeah, there you go. If you're wondering the important things on Sunday morning, the Jaguars are playing in London, right? Man, if you got your Bible, we'll be in Ephesians 2. We'll be moving around. We're in a near, new series called Local. Uh, and I want to start out um, this morning reading uh, right in Ephesians 2, but I want to read from uh, the message translation, uh, Eugene Peterson's beautiful poetic rendering, to kind of get us wrapped around the idea of local church, a local community, what it means to become a local uh, when it comes to our local church community here at Ocean City Church. But the Apostle Paul was preaching to the church at Ephesus. When he preached to a lot of the churches, he's talking a lot about the gospel in the beginning of the epistles. But then he makes this turn and kind of talks about the benefit. This is what's possible. Since you've been raised with Christ, these are the things that are possible. In Ephesians, he says, you know, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. And then what? But God in his great mercy. And then he begins to go into the gospel that Jesus gave away his life, that he broke down the dividing wall of hostility between you and God and you and other people, that you might be brought into this community, that you might become a local. And if you uh, read this with me, it's, it's really good, and it kind of gets our heart geared towards uh, where we're headed this morning. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 19, says, That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You're locals. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. I love that, that language often here, even uh, at OCC. We talk about this being our house, and we say that because you don't what? You don't attend a home. My kids don't attend the home. They belong to the home. They're Harmons. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. And now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God. All of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. I love this because it kind of sets us in motion. And in this series, we're going to look at what it means to be a part of a local church community. We're going to talk about what's hard about it, what's challenging, but also what's amazing about being a part of a local community. I think it's one of those things that can be lost. I know that uh, you are obviously the choir when we talk about preaching to. Um, you're here and you're engaging this morning in the Holy Assembly, part of what um, we call local church community. But when I was thinking about this, this idea, all of us are kind of wired uh, to belong to something, uh, but you know, there's different types of things that you can engage in along the way. And I, I, I told the nine, I'm, I'm allowed once a quarter to use a surfing illustration. I know I mentioned surfing a little more than that, but we live here. Hey, you're at the beach. I'm not going to apologize. Um, so, you know, when, when I moved here many years ago, uh, you know, being, you know, four, four blocks from the ocean, real close to our community here, I just thought, man, it's a great opportunity to learn how to surf. I grew up wakeboarding, doing kind of redneck sports. Uh, and I thought, man, I'm going to be a surfer, man. I'm going to go from redneck to bro. Um, and so I decided to, you know, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn this. Um, and what I didn't know, I mean, I, I thought, I, I knew a little bit about local, like, surf communities. You know, I've watched some movies, you know. I've seen, you know, things about, you know, the California surfing at Trestles and, you know, the old movies. What's the one with Patrick Swayze? Anybody? Point Break, come on, you go, let's do this. Point Break. I mean, I knew, I knew that the whole surf culture, you know, what you do in terms of like what the do's and don'ts in a particular, but I thought, you know, Jacksonville can't be, have a, you know, really aggressive surf community. I was wrong. Um, and you, you come into this community and you can, I mean, depending on where you surf, um, there is some rules. There is some things about surfing in particular spots. Now out in front of the, you know, you know, certain, you know, certain hotels down in North Jacks Beach, you're going to be fine. But you surf the main peaks at the pier or the main peaks at what we call the poles in Mayport and Hannah Park, uh, there is a local surfing community and surfing culture. Not necessarily bad, uh, but it's got its own vibe. And I got very lucky in the, in the early days. David Stutter was here in our first gathering, and he introduced me to a guy named Clay Bennett, um, who uh, like is, you know, 
been in the, this community for over 40 years. Uh, one of the first professional surfers to ever come out of this community. Um, and he was a part of our church for a long time. So I, he was kind of my first stop. And I got extremely lucky because I'd go out and I would surf with Clay. And he would tell me, hey, man, you don't want to do that. Um, he would be the guy that kind of put the brakes on it. And then very quickly after that, my cousin went to, to work with a guy named Mitch Kaufman, who another local legend. So I got a very good, like, they didn't directly tell me, like, hey, to become a local, you've got to follow this rule set. I mean, they just kind of took you out. It's like, hey, man, you probably need to surf a little. And for now, like, this is probably not your section. <laughs> like, you don't need to be right here. There's 150 yards that way, maybe 200, maybe 500 on certain days. You need to be a little bit further away. Uh, and then you kind of, it's not about earning it, but it's about understanding the culture. Like, hey, I don't just start in the, like the, 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 main, the main peak, the main position. There's guys that have earned the right to be there, and there's guys a lot better that, are, that know what the rules are while you're learning, uh, you know, when to go right, left, what you're doing, you know, how to look down the line and make sure you're not dropping in on somebody. All the things that are a part of a serving community, there, there's things to learn. And if you don't want to be a local, then don't learn all the stuff because you won't be. Um, the other thing is, is being present, you know, be, you, know, you know, coming out and surfing these peaks multiple times a week, you know, for 15 years, I, you, they see your face and they've seen my face. So that also is one of those things. They feel comfortable. It's like all of a sudden the people that are the guys in that particular community, and it sounds like this elite thing. If you ever went out there and surfed, everybody is very welcoming um, to a point. Uh, and they are. It's just, very, it's just kind of a good way to say it. And, but it's about presence. It's about being there. And, and if, you weren't there, if you're not there all the time and you're not a regular, you, even if you're a great surfer, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you're probably not going to get as many waves. There's going to be a few people blocking you. You're probably, at least on the main, the main peak. Um, you don't want to be clueless when you're out there. Um, consistent in the same spot. You want to obey the rules, respect the old guys. The old guys get the waves. They don't even have to obey the rules anymore because they're old. They're just like, I get that wave. It doesn't matter that you're there. Um, I'm just going to surf it. And you just got to let them because they've been doing it in the same spot for 40 years. That's just kind of the, the rule that's not a rule that they get to break all the rules, right? Um, there's all these little nuances to becoming a local. Uh, and all of us, I think, in, in understand that to some degree in any anything, whether you're in a country club or you belong to a group, very early on in elementary school, probably more when you roll into middle schools when it gets a little more, you know, aggressive. But there's groups, you know, you would go in, like if you went into Fletcher next week, you would, you would be able to slightly identify the, the clumpings of groups in the cafeteria in and around campus. You wouldn't be able to name them because you're not that cool. But you would know the people that are in, like you would know these different groups. It's because what we, who, how God's made us is somewhat primal. Like there's something about, I said this a few weeks ago, even in the core psychological educational realm, we know that just above, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs in psychology, just above like baseline survival, shelter, food, water, all that, right above that is belonging. It's primal. It's a part of the, the inner part of our instinctive thing that God gave us that we should be with other people. That's how we survive. It's in groups. Now, the problem is, is in our current culture, collectivism, which would be that tribalism, is not what we highlight. In fact, we kind of put down the idea of being a collective, like grouping together in a particular ideology. That's you know, that's the past. That's, what, that's not being progressive. That's something. Uh, progressive individualism is kind of the world that we live in. So we're fighting again against an instinctive thing that we're tribal and that we're collective in the way that God created us. But the world we live in is much a, so much a me culture. Like we, it's, it's about me living my own truth, becoming my own person, creating my own identity, creating my own successes, while at the same time trying to create friendships, I mean, and, and gather people, but having no common ground to gather on, no ideology to, to gather on. What's different about the gospel is it's completely other than our current culture of progressive or uh, individualistic ideology. We, we have a common ground. There's something that identifies Christian communities or at least should identify a Christian community um, in the common ground, and that would be Christ. Now, when you look at a, a surf community, I mean, just to kind of get back to that illustration, um, each community, each 
even each peak, like this is known as a peak, like the, the, the pier. There's a north side peak and a south side peak. North side's not working real good. So if you go over there and you're like, where's the surf? It's not good right now. Sandbar's got to shift around. Little information you get for free. <laughs> so the, everywhere you go, like if you look online, go to one of the premier sites to, to check out the surf and find out what's happening in the surf line. If you go there, they have like a summary of every break. Like there's a bunch right here on the East Coast. And here's, here's the one for the pier. There's one for the poles. There's one in Neptune Beach at peaks that really aren't peaks. But this is their summary. It says Jack's Pier is located in Jack's Beach, several blocks uh, from Beach Boulevard. So if you're coming from out of town, you're not a local and you want to find out some stuff. It says and there's, it's a high tide break, mostly. Um, various, uh, there's various peaks off the pier, uh, that, which serve to spread everyone out a bit. Uh, that's not true. Um, which is good uh, since it's one of North Florida's uh, most aggressive lineups. That is true. Uh, Jacksonville Beach has lefts and rights uh, and works on all swells and conditions. That's also not true. Um, and then when you get into the, the, the section, imagine it's, like it's, all, it's got all these brands, like abilities, anybody, like we can, all levels. Like there's no, it's not hard to surf uh, here at our main peak here in, in Jacksonville Beach. You could get out there and learn there. Um, but there would be a problem if you look at the, the, uh, the rating of local vibe. Uh, it goes from welcoming to intimidating. Uh, you see the rating there. It is intimidating. In fact, they call it moderate to Machiavellian. Uh, so it might be a little intimidating. It is. It's a little intimidating out there. Crowd factor. Uh, it, they, they have a rating mellow to heavy. Uh, it is heavy. Um, spot rating. It is a fun spot to surf. Shoulder burn. That means how far do you have to paddle out and how aggressive is it? Um, based on uh, the way the swell comes in, it's not hard. Uh, water, water quality, clean. Some people oppose that at the nine, but this is like meaning to like toxicity. It's not like sometimes our water's brown but clean because it has tannins from Cyprus and from the river, um, but we have good clean water quality. So I say all that as you can read this description of a local scene. You get all the information about, you know, is it welcoming? You know, is it intimidating? What's, what's it like? And I just thought when I read that, I was like, what would they, what would, if, if, if every church had one of these, like you go to their website and it's like, okay, is it welp welcoming or intimidating? Is it, you know, kind of come as you are or is it a fashion show? And there's a little rating, and tick, 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 you know, where would you be? You know, is this kind of regular people or the beautiful people? Oh, it's really beautiful people. You know, it's like, what would you see when you go to the website? And I thought about what about OCC? And this is when I started thinking, you know, gosh, this is, it's kind of an exposing thing, right? If somebody's job was to write the op-ed about each church and you had a, an app or something, you just cruise around town and go, wow, that's terrible. I mean, Surfline's got an app. What if churches had an app? You know, this is, this is fun. This church has got the, the fun rating. is not so much fun. Uh, I mean, who, who's going to go there? But what if we had that? What, what would that look like? And do we even think about that? Like who are, like, as we become a part of a local community, what's our mindset? Is it one of, we come here to consume, you know, we come here, you know, for good coffee. I'm glad the coffee's good. You definitely should get that. I mean, I have not, I'm just gonna be honest. Don't always love the coffee here. That one, <laughs> dig. So buy it. I mean, and I'm pretty picky on coffee. Um, actually, I'm not. I've, I'm like a Starbucks guy and people laugh at me. They're real picky. They're like, you, it's like an ashtray. Don't know why I like drinking it. So I do. Um, the, some of the other Starbucks people are like, ashtray, you know it is. It's got that burnt taste that you love. Um, but what, you know, when you're thinking about how, you, how you, if people enter, like what does it look like for us to, to not consume but be, belong to something? And then think about, look, we, our mission here is to invite anyone and everyone into the unending ocean of grace that comes through Jesus. Are we more concerned about what type of thing, you know, is, is the kids' ministry, does it serve our needs, is student ministry? Again, we want to we wanna create soft landings, and we want this to feel like an unending ocean of grace in all of our ministries here. Uh, but is that the thing in the forefront of our mind, once we're a part of a church family, what does it look like for us? What does it, you know, what does it mean for us to become a local? And as we kind of launch this series, I want to kind of ask that question. If, you know, if somebody was writing this evaluation in our local community, what would it say? And what should, it, what should we become? What should it look like for us to become a local and how should that affect the way that other people experience Ocean City Church, including this community in general, the people that don't ever come to Ocean City Church. So I want to kind of cover three things um, that we're going to go over about, like, what does it look like uh, for us 
to become a local. I put it in parentheses, and I think this might be the title of my talk. Uh, this is how we do it. This is how we do it. Where's Chris Russell? One of you, right there. It's Friday night. He's, he's, he's done that multiple times at the life course, and you own it. Austin did it this last time. He did a great job, um, but, I mean, it's just not the same. I mean, you are Montel Jordan. So uh, this is how we do it. Like, what, what, what is it when we, when we look at our local community? And we're not, I'm not basing this on rules we've made here at Ocean City Church. We are looking at um, the Word of God. How did the Apostle Paul, as the church exploded in Acts, and all of a sudden, you look at Paul's missionary journey, and you see the church at Ephesus, you see the church at Colossae, you see the church at Philippi, you see the church of Rome, you see all these different things come to life. What are the common factors? What are the, how did Paul, when he was writing letters and he was preaching at these churches, how did he lead them? Like, what were the things that happened, and what did he launch the church with? So that's what we're going to look at. And the, the first one that you, that you find uh, as you dig in is there's a cost. Like, right at the very top, when you read Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, you understand that there's a cost. And the cost was in Jesus' corner. He's the one that paid for it. You did not buy your right to be a part of the church community. You did not buy your right to be back into the presence of God to boldly approach the throne of grace. Jesus paid that. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. You couldn't do anything on your own but God and his great mercy and his love. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We give all the credit to Jesus. He is the one that paid the entry fee for us to be back together as the church, to be able to, to not worry and be selfish and think about, okay, what, what does it look like for me to live selfishly and live life just for me? How did we become a we? Well, Jesus paid that price. Now, when you look at Ephesians 2, again, this is in the message, it says, Christ bought, brought us together through his death on the cross. That's how it happened. The reconciliation was not just between, the, this is an amazing thing about the gospel. The gospel's not, I get to go to heaven and I should probably go to church while I'm here on planet earth. But ultimately, you know, when we die, we get to go to heaven. I pulled my ticket, get to go to heaven. There, the benefit of the gospel is a minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. And one of the amazing benefits of the gospel is that we are no longer an I. We become a we. We become locals. That's why this is not about living in Jack's Beach or in the beaches area. It's not really about proximity. That can make a difference and make it a little more difficult to live life in a local church community. But that's not what the Apostle Paul's talking about when we're talking about local. He's talking about the common ground of Christ's blood, the common ground of his death on the cross that brought us together. Now, I say that when I say there's a cost because... That sets Jesus in the place of head of the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says he, everything is under his feet. So when I think about Ocean City Church, everything is under Jesus' feet. It says he is the head of the church. That is where the authority sits. So we, we lean in to the word of God because he is the word and the word was with God. Jesus is the head of the church. So Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the head. So what does that mean when it comes to cost? Entry fee? You can't pay. Jesus paid it all. He's the one that died on the cross. Nobody, nobody earns their way in. Nobody becomes this, you know, the person that does all the cool stuff, and that's why they're, you know, more rooted in community. Jesus pays it. But it's also how we have to lean towards him because he's the head. He's the cornerstone. He knows best. He bought it. He's the one that does the transforming. So we always lean on him for change. It's his invitation. He shows us the way. He lays the ground rules. He says, follow my example. And he's not doing that because he's reinstituting the law in some way. He wants to lead the church to life and away from death. He paid the price that we would be back in the presence of God with no fear. But then when we come together, he says, I also want to continue because the, the, the penalty of sin has been obliterated by the cross of Jesus Christ, but the redemptive nature of what God's doing is that the power of sin still exists on planet Earth. Ultimately, it's going to be wiped away. We read the book of Revelation. We know Jesus is coming again, and everything's going to get crushed under his feet. But until then, what does he do? He leads us into these 
crazy br- communities of broken people, but people that have been redeemed by the grace and blood of Jesus to be together, to be in a tribe, to support one another, and to carry the mission of Jesus outside these walls to our local community and to the ends of the earth. Started right there in Acts chapter 1. What does he tell them? Holy Spirit's coming. You just wait for it. And then you're going to go where? You're going to go to, you know, to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You're going to be, you're going to be spread out locally, regionally, and globally. But you're going to do it in these, these local communities. The engine of the gospel moves out in and through the local church. So Jesus is the one that lays the ground rules. So there is a cost to be a part of the, the local church. Not, not your entry fee. There's no entry fee. Jesus paid it all. But when you're here, there's a cost for us. For anything that, that's got value, there's going to be a cost. And the first thing that, that we kind of see come off the pages in many places in Scripture is our pride. The, the amount of times that you see that, that, that God doesn't elevate the prideful. He elevates the humble. So the thing that needs to be sacrificed, the cost that, that we have to lay down for our community to work the way that it should is our pride. In the way of vulnerability. I think church classically can, can often be, you know, I got my church self and I got my real self. And this one, I just grew up, I don't know about you, but 15 years in a Christian school, it was like, here's the stuff you're going to show all your, Christ, your school teachers and the people at your church, and here's the, the real Derek. You know, here's the, and they were kind of separate. Here's fun and life, and here's going to church and Jesus, you know, looking at you like, you know, you better, better get it right. And we kind of kept those separate. And we come into church sometimes in those environments and it's, hey, brother, how are you doing? It's, oh, football's good. That's great. The weekend's been, been nice. How are you doing? Is Betty okay? Yeah, she's been doing good. She got out of the hospital last week. And you talk about right here. But the idea of being vulnerable in church is, is one of those things that we have to lay down. Because there's a, there's a humiliating but good thing about being honest and getting in environments, getting ingrained so much in the local church, not that you would walk in Sunday morning and go, Pastor, we need to have confession because I had a bad weekend. Um, you don't want to bleed on the whole church, but there's context and things with, that are built into the church community, like fight clubs. If you've not been here, don't know what they are, you can find them on our website. You know, getting in two, three, four people uh, where you can share together, where you can contend for the church, for your family, and for one another in, the, in those groups. And there's city groups, bigger context. You probably don't want to have a big confession time in your group, city group of 20 people. Um, but to be able to be vulnerable. In 1 John, I love that the, the, that the Apostle John makes this very obvious. To have fellowship with God and to have fellowship with one another, that we need to be vulnerable. Because this wall is this wall of hostility between us has been torn down. We can safely... Um, discuss what we're struggling with with one another. He says, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, listen, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It's like we need to, the, one of the benefits and one of the difficult things in church is getting to that place of where, where we finally get vulnerable. I remember several years ago, uh, we weren't in this building. We were kind of vagabonds moving into different spaces uh, down when we first planted the church. And my office was on A1A. It was this three-story building. Uh, and I loved it. It was cool. It was like, cool, I got my own office, and I'm on A1A. I can get on the very top of the building and watch all the craziness happen on the, off A1A. Uh, it's in South Jacks Beach. And right underneath me was a tattoo shop. It was pretty rowdy. Uh, and then underneath that, there was a weed shop. Um, not much has changed. Uh, we're kind of in the same boat. But like I, I would sit up there, and, you know, we would do Bible studies at night. Uh, and one time we were having, we had a Bible study with a group of dudes up there. And I'm just going to say it. You know, we were kind of a, a white, bright, and polite crew. Uh, it's just who we were. Like, well, let's get together. We're going to crack open the Bible. We got our, you know, our questions. And we're going to go through these questions with these guys. We're going to create some accountability with our group. It's going to be great. Um, I think Mike Berry might have been in this group. Um, and, and I remember we were in the middle of the deal and two of the guys from the tattoo shop, the guy, I guess the, like the sole proprietor, like the guys that own, that own it came up and I knew them. I talked to them a bunch. They were, they were nice enough guys, a little rough around the edges. Uh, they came up and were like, Hey, he, they did that all the time. Sometimes I, I was up there at night just to chat, um, came upstairs 
And hey, what are you guys doing? We're all kind of in a circle, doing our little Christian circle thing, you know? And they're probably like, what? They weren't like, this is weird. They're like, oh, yeah, we used to go to church years ago. You mind if we sit in? Can we, can we hang out? And so they pop into the Bible study. And I tell you what, they, like, when, we, when it comes to, like, bringing things to the light, these boys brought it to the light. Like, they, they talked about everything they did last night, what they did over the weekend, what they were struggling with, pain. I mean, it was about as raw as you could possibly. Just think about, like, something that's inappropriate and then multiply that. Uh, that's what they were doing. And the guys in the group were just like this. I mean, look, and looking at me, like, like wondering, are you going to put, like, what are we doing? Um, and it, it was so awesome. I mean, it was so great. Just, just the rattling of the cages and the idea of, you know, outsiders coming in and listening to the deal and us kind of, you know, the whole, like, I've been in church my whole life, no, 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 doing my thing. And everybody's just like, whoo, this is a real deal right here. And then afterwards, somebody came up to me. It wasn't Mike. Uh, came up to me and said, hey, are we, what are we going to do about this? Like, there's people coming in our, you know, it's, it's like, I, I know we're supposed to love Jesus and uh, bring people in and all that, but we're not going to be able to have Bible. That's like, it's disturbing what they were talking about. Um, and I'm like, man, I was like, I couldn't have been more excited about, about this. Like, this is what we, we have to, like, the problem is, is not, they all, they shared everything and we shared nothing. They, they were vulnerable and we just sat on our high horse of our whatever thinking, Holy smokes, that's awful. And all I, all I could think of afterwards is Jesus looking at me going, you see them? That's you. You're just, you're just it's, you, it's impossible for you to say what's in your heart in front of other people. And we need that. If we don't get there as the church, if we haven't laid down that pride, if we haven't paid that price of repentance in front of our fellow man, fellow woman, then... We're missing out on a huge benefit of freedom. The enemy still has us. And he wants to steal, kill, and destroy the church. He, he would love to. And you know what, how he does that? Keeps it all in the dark and not in the light. So we have to sacrifice our pride and get over that. Um, we have to set aside our own needs. Ephesians 2, again, in the message says, but don't take any of this for granted. He says, it was only yesterday you were outsiders. Now, the context of this, when he says this, leave this up there for a second. He's saying, don't take any of this for granted. What the Apostle Paul is saying is, hey, just yesterday you were an outsider. So how are you going to look at the, the, the new people coming into your world? How are you going to look at the outsiders? You got in and you didn't pay for anything. So remember your heart and your attitude. And he goes on in chapter 4. Listen to this. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. We'll stop there for just a second. Leave it up there. To live a life worthy of the calling that you received. You know what that means? He's saying, remember. Remember what's been extended to you. You've gotten an atom bomb of grace. It wasn't just a little band-aid boo-boo fix of grace. To cover your sin, Jesus had to die and bleed out on Mount Calvary. Wasn't a small one. Remember what was paid. Remember the cost. And he's saying that. I want you to live that life so that around other people, other human beings, you'll, you'll cease to be selfish. And think about your needs when you walk into church, when you walk into church community, when you walk into your own communities, in your families, with your, in your world. He says, because of what's happened to you spiritually, what it's given you the ability to do that you may not have tapped into yet is to be completely humble and gentle, to be patient, bearing with one another in love. And bearing is hard. That means he's basically saying, hey, when you're bearing with somebody, it's not because they're cupcakes. It's because they're difficult. People are hard. I mean, the joke in, uh, like behind closed doors in ministry is, man, ministry would be amazing without the people. Um, it would be, it, but it wouldn't be. I mean, that's just a, a joke. Like, the, what makes it beautiful? What makes it the, one of the more difficult things in life to do, to, to live together in community? Um, it, it, but it's the same thing that makes it the most life-giving thing. This is God's intention. It's what he wants for us, that we would be able to come together. Different people with different ideas, different socioeconomic statuses, different races, all coming together with common ground on the blood of Christ. He paid the way in us to bear with one another in love. 
which means we have to set aside our own needs. He says that in Philippians chapter 2. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. It's like he keeps repeating this at each church because they all need to hear it. Not look, hey, don't look to your own interests. I know you're going to come in and go, well, if the children's ministry is not like this, I think we're just going to have to move on. Um, it's, not, it's, it's like once we've got bought in, we're in. Rather than coming with our consumer list of all the things that we need, it's like we've become a follower of Jesus. How am I going to be a part of inviting anyone and everyone into the unending ocean of grace? Instead of thinking about all the things I need for me and my family, this is what we need, this is what we have to manage the family, we've got, we've got, we've got to do all these things, we've got to do this, this is what we need. and you know, the worship's loud, I don't know why, it's so loud, they got to turn, they need earplugs in the back or something because that's just, we got all the stuff. Now again, if it's too loud, I get it. I mean, you might want to go somewhere else. Um, I know, we'll turn it down. I will turn it down. I'm just kidding. Um, just, uh, I am joking. But you get into this, it's like everything in church world becomes about what it is that is mine. It's interesting. I'll, I'll use this. This is going to get quiet in here probably. But like city groups, like if you're a part of, anybody in part of a city group, anybody in here? Yeah, lots of city group people. Uh, if you're not, they're great. They're like Mary Beth said, it's big church made small. It's where all of a sudden, it's the beginnings of getting, finding those people that you're going to be vulnerable with. You live life with these people. You know, things like, life is hard. You live long enough, you're going to bleed. City groups are great because it's like all of a sudden, people are going to come. You will, it's amazing to see, and it's happened over time and time again in, in our church. It's like before I even get involved or I'm like, hey, I'm going to go visit somebody, five people from their city group has visited them if they're in the hospital or if they're, they're having, they're in the middle of a crisis or they've had a baby and you want to celebrate. It's like their city group is, is on the scene. Um, but here's what happens. Like right now we've got 10, 11 city groups all along in the beaches and, and over the ditch. And it's great. But what happens is the ones that get to know each other real well, they finally, they, they've, they've, they've paid the cost. They're in it. And it's been fun. It's been really good. And they're like, we got our, we got our people now. And what happens is they forget how they got in. They forget at one time you were an exile. At one time you were an outsider. You weren't an insider. And now you become an insider. And what do you, what, what do I hear? Hey, uh, you know, and because what, what happens is the pastor, I don't know who he is, but he sometimes will go, hey, it's time to multiply your group and have other groups. Or, hey, your group, you know, has a little bit of room. It's, it's an open group. We're going to send some people your way. Um, and what we get back sometimes is, hey, no more weirdos in our group. You keep sending as weirdos. Um, and everybody's weird in the beginning. You're weird. I'm just going to say, you were at one time, Paul didn't say it this way, at one time you were an outsider and a weirdo. Um, and you came in and somebody accepted you because of Jesus. And we don't want to forget that. It's like we, we all of a sudden are like, we should have closed groups because we're not. And you could make biblical arguments like we're not going to be able to get vulnerable unless we can travel together for, you know, five years together and close the group. Nobody else can come in. We're going to be really, really good friends. How are you going to invite anyone and everyone into the unending ocean of grace when we have a limit? Like all of a sudden we say, okay, we've got to stop now. It wasn't really anyone and everyone. It was just until we got to capacity with city groups. Right? I mean, it's like all of a sudden it should be the other way around. It should be, oh, my goodness. We got, we got so many people in our group. People keep inviting their neighbors. People keep coming into this deal. Let's, let's find the, the best on-deck leaders or potential leaders. Take two families, and we're going we're gonna to launch another group out of our group. I mean, that's kind of the plan. We're going to multiply, and we're going to pray for them. We're going to bless them. We're going to send them not with the best. Instead of saying, let's kick all the weirdos out and tell them to start their own group. No, you're going you're gonna, to... You're going to bring them, they're going to become mature in Christ, and maybe one day the weirdos will become not weird. You're going to send your best out to plant another city group. And that's kind of the idea. And I'm not saying that's, that's not happening to some degree. But I think even me, I can, the, the, the thing that you can be said, and I remember there was one group uh, that was together. I mean, people that are the leaders in our church, honestly, people that are on staff now, people that have led our church, and they've all kind of spread out, been in different groups since then, but they had this beautiful, wonderful city group for about a year and a half to two years, and they didn't know each other from Adam when they started. By the end of it, they were so close, and it was, they were so sad, because it was like all of a sudden, it was like, well, you can't just, you can't have all these people that, you know, have the love of Jesus in them that can lead a group all in one group. Some of y'all got to go lead another group, and they did, and man, it has helped us expand what, what God's done in, our, in the community here, and more and more people have come to know Jesus because of people's sacrifice, because it, it costs something. It costs something. 
So now that you're local, we can't start getting selfish. We got to remember that one time you were an outsider and God allowed you to come in. We can't have gospel amnesia and forget where we were and where God's brought us. Secondly, there's a commitment. It's not just a cost. There's a commitment. There's a regular kind of rhythm to what we do. Hebrews 10, 25 says, hey, we don't want to give up meeting together, talking about the Holy Assembly as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. If you ever come to acclimate, and the first thing she says is, hey, you want to get connected? Be around. Presence is a huge deal. Like that is how you are known. And people are like, well, Sunday morning's not the thing. Maybe city group, but Sunday morning's not the... And I get that. And I'm not the attendance pastor. I mean, if you've been here long enough, it's like... I get that, that life, the rhythms of life, being at church every Sunday at all costs um, is not something that, you know, we, we preach a lot here. I'm just saying, hey, if you're having trouble connecting, start asking yourself the question, am I around? Like to become a local here when it comes to serving community, if you're not present, you will not be a local. They will not know you. You will not, the, seeing your face, that is part of it. That's how you become known. That's, that's what, what changes things in the, the priority matrix of, you know, what, what we do at church. Being a part of the Holy Assembly, being around, being present is a big deal. With my, with my kids, we learned this from another family. It was great. We were eating at V Pizza, and one of my kids was texting me going, hey, you know, they, they couldn't come for whatever reason, didn't say anything. We were trying to track them and find out where they were because we were going out. We don't go out to eat all that often. We're like, hey, they might want to come with us, you know. It's a, it's a treat. Um, and they're like, no, can you bring me something home? So we're getting like to go food for them at home. And the other family's like, oh, we don't do that. And we're like, what? What do you mean? You don't, you're going to bring food to the baby boy? has got to get him some food. Um, <laughs> and they said, oh, no, we have a rule called present to win. You got to be present to win. Like if you want it, you, it's family time. You want to, and so we started doing that. It's been the best, he's the best thing we've done for our family. Like, I mean, you, you, we, we let them know, hey, we're doing cruisers tonight. They know we're not bringing cruisers home. And the cheese fries just, they, they went out over nappy time. They do. It's like, they know cheese fries and ranch. They, they'll be in the corner. I just, can you bring me some cheese fries? They know present to win. And they show up. Even if we don't drive, all drive together, it's like cars start you know, burning rubber in a cruiser. Joy, yeah. You know, they're there, present to win. The benefits of being present, they're there. I'll say that with city groups, the same thing. If you, it's like, oh, I can't find any connection. You show up, and if you think, okay, my, my city group's struggling, and you're like, I, I need another city group, or man, I don't know about, be the institution of change. Be the family that comes in and make, hey, if you think your city group's lame, and you're like, gosh, my city group's lame. It's lame because you're lame. Because you have the opportunity to change that lame city group. Change it. Don't be lame. You're part of it. Own it. You're no longer an outsider. You're, you're no longer a, you know, they do this, they do that. You're a we. Lame because you're part of it. Get in there. Make some changes. It's a different way of looking at it. You got you to commit. Either you're in or you're out. You can't be in the peanut gallery. It's easy to be in the peanut gallery and throw shots at all the things that aren't done the way that you think you'd have them. That's, that's easy. Get in the arena, blood, sweat, and tears with all the people that have sacrificed to, to, to create the environment where you, you were able to step into the unending ocean of grace and experience Jesus the way that you have. It, it will change. If it's way more fun anyway. It's hard sometimes because there's people and there's hurt. But man, is it better to be in the arena than the peanut gallery just kind of throwing shots. I mean, and don't, I think sometimes we, we come in and we expect to come in and like, I, this has happened over the years, just, you know, being in ministry. It's like people come in with unbelievable ministry experience and skill and, and, and things along the way. And they are put off sometimes by the fact that it's like, we don't immediately put somebody in charge of a group or put somebody in charge of student groups or put somebody in, you know, on the worship team doing stuff like day one. And there's a reason to that. It's not because they're not skillful, but there is a, there's a process for a reason. There's a mature, a mature thing. There's a commitment thing. There's a, there's a faithfulness. I, I, I said this recently. I think it was at one of our anchor meetings recently. Like the, the leaders in this church are not the most skilled people. Like they, they're skilled, but that's not why they're where they are. They're leading because of faithfulness over time. It just takes time. 
It's just like a team, any team that you're, you're, you're on. It's not like you start in high school football, two a day start beginning of August, you're two a day just sweating it out, just grinding with the team. And then the guy, there's a guy that comes in that's, you know, he's super skilled, comes in, you know, ready to play quarterback September 15th. What's the coach going to say? What's the team going to say? We've all been sweating, all been here, going to Derek's house in between the deal to swim because it's hot. And where do you show up September 15th expecting to start and to play? And that's no, I mean, I'm not trying to be, be mean. It's just, it's not good for you to come in with all of that and be all of a sudden put in a position. There's a representation of faithfulness that the, the, the Apostle Paul will represent in these epistles as we get in through these, these weeks. Now, there's a season in church where you got to date. You got to date the church. There's things that you want to make sure that the church has right? That they're gospel-centered, that Jesus is the head of the church, that the, the, the biblical teaching comes from something that we see as inerrant. This is the God-breathed text. We want this to be our, our ultimate filter, that we believe in the gospel, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone, the five solas. We want those things. You should be, those should be on your list, that, that's way better than children's ministry. I don't know, it's a little hot in there. And Bubby, was, he came out, he was so sweaty. And that's, I mean, the five solas should be a big, on, the, on the list. That's what we should do when we're, when we're filtering church. And you can, for a season, there's the dating phase. Like, I'm not ready to fully be in yet. I'm trying to figure out, you know, can I put, my, put myself, can I belong here? Not attend, belong. Can I put myself under the authority of the church here? That's okay. But at some point, somebody's got to get the final rose. You know what I mean? The show ends. And it's like, commit. <laughs> you got to get in there, right? You're picking up. Some of you are very disturbed. You're like, does he watch The Bachelor? We're not coming here ever again. <laughs> so judgmental. If I could sit in your house and you not know, I would see things. <laughs> Kidding. But, but the, the, the last thing, like the, it, there's a cost. There's a cost to being a part of a community. But there's also the benefit in that cost. You know, there's, you know, being persistent and coming in and doing the things that God's called us to do when it comes to community in general um, and commit. But there's also a huge benefit in that there's safety. The Apostle Paul says this in uh, Ephesians chapter four. He says, so Christ gave himself, uh, so Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. This is like the leadership of the church. Actually, this is the ultimate servants, the ones that should be serving the most, the ones that should be the, the lowest, serving from a low position up because Jesus washed feet. He gave these people and put them in the church to equip the people for good works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of Christ. So they're building the church. Why? Why are we, why is there accountability and covering that's created in the organizational construct of the church? Well, the Apostle Paul says why. Why do you need all this? Why do you need to equip the people for works of service? What's, you know, obviously we're going to go out and carry the gospel. Second Corinthians chapter 5, you've got the ministry of reconciliation. Now you're going to carry it out there. But why do we need all of this church business with pastors and teachers and evangelists? And why do we need to be built up? Why do we need to, to reach this unity in the faith? Why can't I just roll with me's and mine? Well, he says in verse 14, he says, then you will no longer be infants. Hard language, but it's true. It's like, don't want to be a bunch of babies being tossed back and forth by the waves, being pulled by society, by culture, by the world around us, by the quote-unquote non-foundational you know, truth. There is no truth, right, in our culture. But it's, it's where we get blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. There's protection covering and accountability, there is safety. Because when we come together, we, we are speaking the truth in love. We grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, covered and accountable. I use this illustration. It works much better because um, Chris and Megan are here, but CrossFit's one of those things. There's a covering and accountability in the box. I don't CrossFit, and I probably should, and I feel really bad because they're looking at me. 
Um, like, he doesn't eat clean, I know. Um, but there's something beautiful about it. There's a reason that, that, that like, doing, you know, $9 at the, you know, Planet Fitness. And if you do that, it's great. I'm 10 bucks, man. You go in there, you know, somebody hit the lunk alarm on you, it's great. But it's different, right, than being somewhere where people know your name. People know who you are. Your name's on the wall. Like, your per- like all your personal stuff that you're trying to accomplish, people know what it is. And when you accomplish it, there's people celebrating with you. You don't show up to do whatever workout name they got going on <laughs> at the box. People call you. They call you, don't they? I mean, it's like people say, hey, man, why were you there at 530? We're supposed to be working out at 530. It's, you feel something. And it's not a guilt thing. It's a cover, cover safety accountability thing. These people are vested with you, wanting you to succeed just as much as they want to succeed themselves. They want you to to drop the weight just as much as they wanted to drop the weight themselves. They wanted to get that bicep just as much as you wanted to get that bicep. They're in it with you, covered and accountable. There's There's a safety thing that happens in the context of the local church. Is it perfect? It is far from perfect. Is there, can you get hurt inside the church, inside the walls of the church in this beautiful, wonderful thing, the, the local community? Yes, there's people in here and they're bad, sinful people. But the redeemed nature of what God's done, we work through that. We, that's why we bear with one another in love. He says that this in Ephesians chapter three, the apostle, he says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love. I love this. He says, may have power together. You got to understand the context of the epistles was always a we. We like have our own quiet time and we read the epistles. That's fine. You should. It's great to learn the Bible and get with God and have conversations with God about the Bible. But these were written context wise to be read publicly in these churches. It's we. They use we language. The apostle Paul's using we language because this is what we're doing together with all the Lord's holy people saying, hey, when we come together, you want to be rooted and established. You want to be a part of it. Christ paid the price for you to be a part of it, that you might have power together with all the Lord's holy people. To what? To grasp how wide, how long, and high, and deep the love of Christ is. The challenging thing about that passage is without each other, we will not experience the full nature and the full depth of God's love. And I'm not saying that as a bold statement as a pastor. I just read it. He's saying, you're going to be able to grasp it how? Together. How high, how wide, how deep. You're going to get rooted and grounded. They're going to make these, I'm not going to attend church. I'm going to to belong to a community. I'm going to be covered and accountable. I'm going to bear with one another in love. I'm not going to look at my own interest maybe sometimes, but people are going to call me out on it. We're going to come together and we're going to get rooted and grounded. And in that, guess what the promise is for you and, you and me, is we'll experience more of Christ's love. More and more of Christ's love. What a beautiful thing. I mean, the, the, the culture, speed is what we want. We want everything. We want fast food. We want fast everything. And you know what? I mean, if you want to go fast, go alone. It is, it's like easier. You don't have all the baggage, all the stuff. Go fast, go alone. You want to go far, though, you go together go together. And the beautiful thing about safety in the church is that it's all based on the fact that Christ is the head, that he is the shepherd. He is the one shepherding this flock. He's the the one that has the, the authority of the church under his feet. That should be the most comforting thing of all, that he is the shepherd. You know, when I was, uh, I was in Costa Rica years ago. I know some of you have been on mission trips with 6-8 Ministries, and I went, um, this is probably in 2007. Um, the team house looked a lot different. If you've been there, there's right now you can sit in the team house in Alabalita and look south um, towards San Jose, but you could look a little bit like northwest and see on, the, on a hill or northeast and see on this little hill, um, you know, this, the, kind of the side of a mountain. I got my Bible open, doing what you do on a mission trip. You know, you got your journal, you got your Bible, you're taking notes, you know, about all the things that are happening. You know, went up the mountain, got rained on 18 times, you know, did all the stuff. And I got John 10 open because it's that 
part of my thing. And I'm like, I've read this a million times that he's the good shepherd. You know, he's the one that you know, everybody listens to his voice. The sheep listen to his voice. He knows everybody by name. He leads them out to find good pasture, leads them in. You know, if somebody comes over the walls or the naughty person, that's the bad people. You know, that's the enemy. That's the wolves that have come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's telling the Pharisees all this stuff, using all this shepherd's language. And I'm thinking, I don't, I was like, I've read this so many times. I was about to turn to something else. Like, ah, I'm just not feeling it. And then all of a sudden I hear, Meh! and I'm like, you know, like, what is this? I look over up to the mountainside and there's, there's a, sh- a shepherd. I mean, what, what times in life are you just like thinking and it's like all of a sudden there's a shepherd. I mean, it's not, you just don't see shepherds. I'm just sitting there and literally 40 yards away, there's a shepherd just cruising around, and I'm talking about a truckload of sheep. And he's just kind of walking on, yeah, 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 yeah. He's just making voice because they all hear his voice and they follow him. And I'm reading the thing. I'm starting to get a little misty eye going, there's a shepherd there, and he's probably calling them all by name, like chubby, you know, bumpy, lumpy, fuzzy, broken, whatever he's got, names for all of them. Ah! And they're all just kind of following him. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. It's like they hear his voice and they literally are following him. He's the head. They feel safe when they're with him. Look at this. This still happens today. This blows my mind. Because you think about it in, Bible, in the Bible, it's like we, they all knew. When he's telling these stories, they're all like, we get it. We understand. We don't quite get it until we kind of dive in and go, man, this is pretty crazy. The shepherd leads and they follow. Like they don't have to do a whole lot. They got their stick. Ah, yeah, yeah, and do their thing and they're following. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And Jesus when he's talking about the sheep, he's talking about protection. He's talking about life is gonna happen when they follow me. I know them by name. I know who they are and they need protection. And he, he begins to talk about the sheep pen and he talks about the gate, that they're gonna go out of the gate, get good pasture, and I'm gonna lead them in the gate. Basically, he's talking at night, they're coming through the narrow gate. He makes a reference to the narrow gate in and yeah, it's an actual, and there's a bunch of these in modern like shepherdry, whatever you call it. That's what they have. They got a pen. And he's, he says in Matthew chapter seven, and I never put this together until this week. And maybe, you, you know, you need to go to a church where the pastor knows this kind of thing, but I just was mind blown. Matthew chapter seven, when he's talking about the narrow gate, he's saying, wide is the gate and the path to destruction. Narrow, and we don't like narrow gates. I even preaching that's hard because I'm like, non-Christians don't like that, that idea. There's one way. There's one way and that's the only way you go. You know, there's one way to, to, to the Father. You know, that's it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's talking about the narrow gate. He says, wide is the path to destruction. You wanna, we all want the wide gate. Many choices. I like wide gate. You know, I want to do this. I got this on tap. I don't like any of the rules. Narrow gate. I don't like one way, his way. I like my way right away, right? Burger King. I want to do it the way I want to do it. But Jesus, the point he's trying to make in Matthew chapter 7 is the point he was making in in John chapter 10 is this is why it's so safe. It's because there's one way in and one way out. And this is the coolest thing. This is what the shepherd does at night. Check out this next guy. He sits and sleeps in the gate. He is the gate. And nobody's coming in there. He literally is laying his life down for the sheep. Wolf comes, he's going to eat him first. He's going to be the one bloodied out at the doorway of the gate. Nobody's getting in. Nobody does this. And Jesus is making the point, hey, the manager, the, all these other people that you think care about the sheep, they don't care about the sheep. I care about the sheep. They know my voice. I know them by name. And that's where I sleep. You know why it's safe in the pen? It's because there's one way in, one way out. And I am the one who bled out to make the gate. I am the one who closed the gap with my blood. I am the one who has made this safe and complete. Jesus was standing. He was getting ready to be crucified a week before, and he looks to Jerusalem. It says he set his eyes towards Jerusalem like a flint. And you know what he says, and this means so much more to me now this week? He said, he's bawling and crying. And you know what he says? He says, I see sheep without a shepherd. And I look at that. I'm like, that's what he was thinking. They got a wide gate. One way. My way. It's the way to safety. It's the way to life. And look at the, look at it. It should illuminate 
the, the table today. Like what we think about when we think about communion. I mean, I, sometimes we take communion in a flippant way, but now I'm thinking right here, it's a scenario gate. That's what this table is. Being invited to this table is a reminder of the narrow gate, what he's paid for, what he's done. You know, when he was with his friends, they had no idea what he was talking about. But in Jesus' mind, could you imagine knowing all the things that he knew? When he's doing these illustrations, he's like, you guys don't get it. It's the best sermon illustration of all time. You don't even understand. And then he comes and he, he grabs his Passover, grabs the bread. He takes in his hands. He said, this is it's my body broken for you. It's my body. He's talking about giving and laying his life down for his friends. It's like, it's my body broken for you. The same way he, he took the cup, he says, this is my blood, this is a new covenant. The way this all went, like for you to commune with God, be in God's presence, to worship God, something had to happen once a year that was going through outer court, inner court, altar of incense, curtain, holy of holies, one priest, one time a year. That was the system to say that you cannot make it on your own. So Jesus instead comes all the way out. He's not even inside the walls of the temple when he's raising his glass. He says, hey, new covenant in my blood. There's a new way. There's a new way. And this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna come together. When you come together as a church, you're gonna break this bread. You're gonna drink this cup and you need to keep on doing it because you need to remember. Like Paul said, don't take this for granted because you start taking it for granted, you're gonna all of a sudden close off the walls and you're not gonna let anybody in. You're gonna say, oh, no more outsiders coming in. And Jesus is like, no, we're gonna tell them shepherd that's what we're going to do changes the way that we think about communion so as we as we come today we're remembering what christ has done that he broke down the wall of hostility between 